G'day guys and welcome to this week's episode of Simply Fit and it's my frequently asked questions segment again. So I've got a few really good questions um, to go through this week. Uh, the first one was top five bodybuilders dead or alive. So this is my opinion on my favorite top five bodybuilders of all time. So we'll start at number five, of course Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mr. Olympia, seven years, one 1970 to 1975. For the 1975 Mr. Olympia, he was filming the movie Pumping Iron, which is arguably one of the best movies of all time, whether it be bodybuilding or normal movie. Um, won the six times there, came back in 1980 while he was filming the movie Conan, he was downsized. By then bodybuilding had evolved, uh, people like Mike Mensa were in the mix and he got a controversial win. Uh, which was controversial because he wasn't the best on stage, but he still got the win. His uh, flamboyancy and his stage presence probably got him over the line with that one. So he ended up getting seven uh, Mr. Olympia wins in his time. The most influential bodybuilder of all time. He's still relevant today. His name is known by everybody, so that's why he's my number five. Number four is Phil Heath. Seven-time Mr. Olympia tied with Arnold. He won from 2011 to 2017. Really, really good, good physique. One of the first proper uh, social media bodybuilders of this age. So sort of when uh, Facebook and all that sort of came around, he was a champion. So he got a lot of flack for being on top and um, pretty arrogant person. I didn't really like him uh, as a person, but as a bodybuilder, he was awesome. And uh, yeah, he did really well. Seven wins. He lost in 2018 to Sean Roden. Uh, which would have made him tie for Ronnie Coleman and Lee Haney's record of eight wins in a row. So yeah, seven wins for Phil Heath, awesome bodybuilder, number four. Number three is Dorian Yates. So Dorian Yates came around in 1990. He started winning the Olympia in 1992 to 1997 for six wins. Uh, he was the first of the mass monsters of this era. So he was the first really, really big, solid bodybuilder trained hard in England. He was known as the shadow. So he'd come to competitions with a butcher's cloak on, um, nothing, showing nothing to nobody. He'd just take it off, walk out, win, put it back on and go back to England and train for next year. So back then when there was only magazines, people would be waiting for three or four months for photos of the Olympia to come out and Dorian would be winning. So he cleaned up 1992 to 1997. That's why he's my number three. Number two is Jay Cutler. So he's been around at the time when my number one person was around and it was like a grinding one and two for years. So Jay Cutler was a very young bodybuilder when he turned pro. He started training properly at 18. His genetics were phenomenal. And he started getting in his stride and had a lot of second place wins to second place finishes to my number one guy. He then finally dethroned the person number one in 2006. He won 2006 and 2007. And then he lost the title to Dexter Jackson in 2008. So what happened then was he was ridden off. Everyone said once you lose the title as Mr. Olympia, you'll never regain it. It's never been done. Everybody wrote him off. He came back in 2009 and destroyed everybody with arguably his best look ever. There's a, a photo of his quad stomp, which is a, a pose when he walked out and placed, uh, stomped his leg on the ground to flex his quads. And he, that's one of the most iconic photos of bodybuilding of all time. Won 2009 and 10, and then as I said before, lost to Phil Heath in 2011. So Jay Cutler's got four wins with that split in the middle. What he's so good about is social media and business in bodybuilding. He, every win he got, he'd buy a house. So he started buying houses in Las Vegas at a young age and would use his winnings to put deposits on houses and now he's worth millions for property as well as bodybuilding. So he's done a really good job of monetizing the business of bodybuilding, which is something a lot of people don't do. They become very popular and blow their money. So he's done really well and he's still doing really well. He's still relevant. The younger generation coming up these days know Jay Cutler. He hasn't been on stage since 2013. He made a brief comeback and I think he finished seventh off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, he's an awesome bodybuilder, really good person as well. Then we go to number one, Ronnie Coleman, Mr. Olympia, eight years in a row. So he's tied with Lee Haney. So Lee Haney won from 1984 to 92. 
He, uh, Ronnie Coleman, eight years, to, uh, 1998 to 2005. So in 1997, he finished ninth. He wasn't on the radar for a win. People were talking about Nasser El Sambate, Kevin Lavrone, Flex Wheeler, everyone like this as the next crown after Dorian Yates retired in 1997 after his last win. Uh, Ronnie Coleman came out and absolutely destroyed everybody and then gave no ground up and he was Mr. Olympia eight years in a row. Greatest physique ever, best all-round proportion, size, symmetry, condition. He's insane. He's just got the best genetics. Really, really good bodybuilder. Good person, full-time police officer for the first three full Mr. Olympias. So he's working full-time in the Arlington, Texas police um, force and winning Mr. Olympia at the same time. So it's insane to think that he's doing the best of one sport while working full-time in a job that's demanding. So yeah, love Ronnie Coleman. He's still, again, like the other guys, relevant today. He's got a lot of social media influence and just the greatest bodybuilder of all time, and he'll always be the greatest. I don't think there'll be any one of our lifetimes that's uh, supersede him and become better in terms of just legendary status. So that's my top five. Arnold, Phil Heath, Dorian Yates, Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman, number one. I just thought I'd throw out there an honourable mention of someone who I really like and um, who really changed the landscape of bodybuilding. So Rich Piana. He died in 2017, he was only 46 years old. He was never really a, a really good professional bodybuilder. He won Mr. California and he done it, did a few other things, but he was really well known to be probably the first social media influencer bodybuilder. So he burst on the scene, his videos went viral, he spoke the truth, he runs a company called 1% Nutrition, and he would talk about eating normal food. Don't buy supplements, just eat food. And he just talked real things and he was very relatable. So he was a really big influence for me coming through bodybuilding. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd give him an honorable mention because he still, to this day, his videos pop up and they're good to watch. He's just a massive loss to the bodybuilding community. And uh, yeah, he deserves to be in there somewhere. Weighing yourself each day. So should you weigh yourself each day or what, what should you do? So this question gets to asked of me a lot and my thinking of this is you should not weigh yourself each day. And I'm, I'm saying that from someone who has weighed themselves each day. So I've got some notes in my phone from 2022 where I weighed myself each day and sometimes multiple times of the day. And I'd even write what I was wearing. So I'd write underpants or I'd write nothing or I'd write socks and shorts and it was obsessive and it was every day. And if I saw those scales moving either way, it would really play um, mind games with me. So yes, yeah, so I've been there where I've weighed myself each day thinking that you're being diligent and you're doing everything correctly and you know, you're a bodybuilder so you need to get everything, you know, every day you weigh yourself and all this stuff. All it does is create bad habits and unhealthy habits. So say so you have six liters of water, that's six kilograms that you're putting in your body. You're gonna be six kilograms heavier if you're not getting rid of that water fully. So you might wake up one day and you're a kilo heavier. You might wake up the next day and you're a kilo lighter. You have a cheat meal, you could be two kilos up two days later because of the sodium and the water retention. It's just very, very obsessive to weigh yourself each day and it's not a good habit. My suggestion now to everybody is just weigh yourself once a week if you wanna weigh yourself at all. So you don't need to weigh yourself. Use the mirror as a guide in your clothing. If your underpants are looser, you're looking better. If you look better in the mirror, that doesn't lie. So the scale is only one system to gauge how you're getting progress. You should weigh yourself to see where you're at, but you don't need to weigh yourself. So there's pr plenty of people that don't weigh themselves. Arnold Classic winner this year, 2023, Samson Dowder, and third place at Mr. Olympia, doesn't weigh himself. He's the third best bodybuilder in the world, and he won't weigh himself for the exact reasons I just explained. He if he sees the scale is coming down too fast, he thinks he's getting small, he's gonna get in his head, cortisol is released, stress hormone, and he's going to inevitably eat more food to put the weight back on or think he's eating uh, too much and he'll try to lose weight. So it's just very, very detrimental to our goals. So my suggestion, weigh yourself once a week, see where you're at and just log it down and do it on the same day. If you're having a cheat meal on a Wednesday night, make it a, su a Sunday morning, you weigh yourself. So give you a couple of days for that cheat meal to clear out your system and the body, to the water to come back to normal. But it doesn't matter when you weigh yourself, 
just do it once a week at the maximum. Don't go any more than that. How is this possible? So if you look at the picture I've put up here, you have a client of mine who has lost three and a half kilos in five weeks, yet their calories have gone from 1,100 to 2,000 calories a day in that time. So a lot of you guys will be thinking, how is this possible? They're eating more food, yet they're losing weight. So that's what I try to teach people here in general. You need to eat to lose weight. So I like to say the body's like a coal train. So yeah, I have analogies for everything which helps me understand things. So a coal train requires coal to let it run down the train line. So people are shoveling coal into that train each day, each every minute or so, and that train's continuing. That's the metabolism. So if we're shoveling food in our mouth every two hours, our metabolism's spinning down that train line as well. So by sacrificing calories so severely at 1100 like they were, their metabolism is going into survival mode and everything's slowing down. The body's smarter than what we are and is saying, you're not giving me food. Next time you feed me, I'm gonna store that as energy, AKA body fat, and I'm going to hold that for emergencies. So, got the client up to 2000 calories and they're down three and a half kilograms in a short time. So, moral of the story, you need to eat to lose weight. If you want more details on this, Give me a message in the comments section, go to my Instagram, go to my TikTok, send me a message anytime and I'll explain things a bit further for you. New age coaches reinventing the wheel. What do you think about the new age coaching terminology and people trying to reinvent the wheel? So yeah, this is a good one. So there's a new age of coaching and people that think they're experts and are loud on social media and carry on like pork chops. And they have little keywords which are annoying and they try to glamorize bodybuilding or glamorize prepping and they make it sound less um, normal than what it is. So as an example, I've had clients that will say to me, oh, so-and-so doesn't have cheat meals. They have refeeds. They're so much better than cheat meals. Why don't we do refeeds? A refeed and a cheat meal is the same thing. It's just got a different name. So a cheat meal and a refeed achieve the same purpose. You're trying to eat excess calories for a day or a meal. I don't recommend cheat days, I recommend cheat meals. So have a three hour window and eat your food, eat whatever you want. Get your calories up as high as you want for that day, get rid of all of the things that you want to eat out of your brain and get back to your prep the next meal. So. People call cheat meals refeeds, and they'll say, oh, I'm refeeding today, I'm just gonna have another 1,000 calories of my regular food, blah, 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 blah. That's ridiculous. Go get a pizza and eat it. It's the same thing, and you're gonna be less annoying as a person. So yes, cheat meals and refeeds are the same thing. Don't call it a refeed, just call it what it is, it's a cheat meal. Another little topic is people saying grow season or improvement season. So. It's called an off season. It's been called an off season since bodybuilding started for a reason. You're not dieting or you're not prepping for a competition. You're in the off season mode. Like every other sport, there's a season and there's off season. Bodybuilding's the same. People say they're in the grow season or an improvement season just to make it sound like they're still like smashing the gym and they're still doing everything 100%. The thing is, an off-season's there to unwind, relax. You're not gonna go off your diet fully. You're not gonna look like a bag of shit. You're just going to take, dial it back a little bit, have some foods you wanna eat, maybe increase your cheat meals, not your refeeds, and just enjoy yourself. So there are a couple of terms that get thrown around so much these days, it really annoys me. Just call it what it is. It's an off-season, it's a cheat meal. There's no other words for it. Don't try to make it sound cool, just, do bodybuilding how it's meant to be done. Building a budget gym in under $500. So this is a good question. Um, can you do it? Yeah, you can do it for sure. So I'll put a few pictures up here. So of some items that I think you should be able to get cheaply, whether it be on Marketplace or you go to your local sports store or Kmart or whatever you have in your area, you can get these cheapish and get good enough quality to get a good workout in. So the number one thing is just get a cheap um, bench. So incline, decline bench, 
It doesn't have to be anything special. It can be torn up, it can be damaged. It doesn't matter as long as you can lay on it and it can take your weight and doesn't buckle under you and you know, it's a semi-solid, perfect. Grab a bench, you can incline it. Some you can decline, but as long as you get flat and incline, you can do lots of things on that bench. Number two is a set of adjustable dumbbells. So just go and again, go on Marketplace, get a set of dumbbells. In Australia, we speak in kilograms. So get a set of dumbbells to say 20 kilograms. That's gonna give you weight that you can do for every exercise pretty much. You can, it doesn't matter how strong you are, you can still do a 20 kilogram bench press and make it feel heavy. So they're a fantastic way, they're adjustable, you can make them light, you can make them heavy, you can do all sorts of things. And the third thing that I suggest is getting a uh, set of budget bands. So bands are awesome. You, I've got a $10,000 multi-station machine in my gym here. Literally a $30 band will do exactly what that machine does and I can make it feel exactly the same. So you don't have to go expensive to get a really good workout in. You can incorporate those bands with the dumbbells and start doing banded dumbbell work and fantastic. There you've got a really good setup. And the last thing I'd suggest is just any top of um, barbell and some basic plates. And again, go on Marketplace, find them cheap. It doesn't have to be an Olympic barbell with the 50 um, millimeter collar and the 50 millimeter plates. Just get a standard barbell, it doesn't matter. Get a set of plates. It doesn't, again, have to be heavy, maybe 40, 50 kilograms of weights in total. And then you need some squat stands. So the way, reason I suggest squat stands is they're very universal. You can bench out of them. You can bicep curl out of them. You can squat out of them. You can do shoulder presses out of them. They're not just a one exercise item. You can move them around. You can take them outside. You can put them closer together, wider apart. You can attach those bands to them. You can do lots of work with the squat stands. So there you go. Incline bench, set of adjustable dumbbells, basic barbell and plates, some bands and squat stands. And you've got a good setup and I guarantee you if you go on Marketplace, you find all this for under $500 and you can get really 95% of every workout done and get a really good result.